I'm Michaela Peterson, Jordan's daughter. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's called A Wrestling with God. Yesterday, Dad released the podcast he and I did on his YouTube channel. It was originally released on my podcast, but he thought it was a good idea to release it on his channel so it would be more widespread. Yesterday was also World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, and so this seemed like an appropriate day to bring some awareness to the medication that nearly cost my dad his life. If you haven't seen the video yet, it's uploaded on his YouTube channel, or the audio version is on my podcast, the Michaela Peterson Podcast. We'll be doing another health update in podcast form in a few weeks. For now, Dad's still doing very well. He's finishing up his book, swimming, getting stronger, and everything's still going well. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's fantastic to have my dad returning to health, and you guys know how long of a journey it's been. Part of that journey has involved taking NAD supplements, which meant we had to be hooked up to machines for hours at a time. It was worth it because NAD improves your long-term health by working at the cellular level, but it was definitely a sacrifice in the short term. That's why I'm glad to have found a supplement called Basis made by the company Elysium. Basis is the first and only NAD dietary supplement based on 25 years of research in the science of aging. It works by activating what scientists call our longevity genes and changing the way you age. Many of the benefits of increased NAD are things you won't feel right away, like enhanced mitochondrial function, active longevity genes, and improved DNA repair. But many people also report increased energy levels, better sleep, and more satisfying workouts. Plus, it's easy. Just take two capsules a day to improve the way you age. Listeners can get 10% off of a monthly subscription to Basis by visiting trybasis.com slash Jordan and using the promo code Jordan10. That's trybasis.com slash Jordan and the promo code Jordan10. That's a great deal on a groundbreaking supplement. It's been more than 75 years since many courageous soldiers, maybe even your grandfather, left home to fight in World War II. I didn't have any relatives that fought in World War II or World War I. My great-great-grandma actually went and got my 16-year-old great-grandfather and brought him home when he tried to go fight in World War I. You know my obsession with digging up details like this in my family history, and that's why I use Ancestry.com. In honor of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, Ancestry.com has released a U.S. draft card collection with over 36 million draft cards completed by fighting age men in the United States, whether they ended up serving or not. There's a great chance that your relatives are among them. You can find things like their home address, physical description, and other details about their lives. It's pretty interesting. Discover your untold stories and more. Head to my URL at Ancestry.com slash Jordan to start discovering your story today. That's Ancestry.com slash Jordan. Season 3, Episode 14, A Wrestling with God, a Jordan B. Peterson Lecture. All right, so the last time I was here, many of you were as well, we got halfway through the story of Jacob, and I've been digging underneath the story sporadically since then to to try to find out what other themes are being developed and I've got some things that I think are really interesting to talk about so um, so we'll get right into it so I'm going to review a little bit first so we were talking about Jacob um, and I'll re-update his biography a little bit so that we can place ourselves in the proper context before we go on So his mother, Rebecca, gave birth to twins, and the twins, even in her womb, were struggling for, well, they were struggling, and of course the story is that they were struggling for dominance, the older, or the younger against the older, really, because Jacob, Jacob means usurper, and Rebecca had a, uh, what would you call, a vision from God that said that Jacob would supplant Esau. And so even before her twins were born, they were in a state of competition. And that's a recapitulation of the motif of the hostile brothers, right? It's a very, very, very common mythological motif. And we we already saw that really well developed in the story of Cain and Abel, right? And Cain and Abel were essentially the first two human beings, the first two natural born human beings. And they were instantly locked in a state of enmity, which is symbolic of First, the enmity that exists within people's psyche between the part of them 
you might say, that's aiming at the light and the part of them that's aiming at the darkness. And I think that's a reasonable way of portraying it. Obviously, it's a way that's sort of rife with symbolism, but my experience of people, especially when you get to know them seriously or when they're dealing with serious issues, is that there is quite clearly a part of them that's striving to do well in the world or even to do good, and another part that's deeply cynical and embittered that that says to hell with it and is self-destructive and lashes out and really aims at making things worse. And so that seems to be a natural part of the human psyche and that's also reflected in the, the idea of the fall. And so those ideas are not easily cast away. They're associated with the rise of self-consciousness, right, in, in the story of the Garden of Eden. And I think that's right because... I do think that our self-consciousness produces that division within us because more than any other creature, we're intensely aware of our finitude and suffering, and that tends to turn us at least to some degree against being itself. You know, I was watching uh, a bunch of protesters in the U.S. last week scream at the sky <laughs> about Trump, you know, and... Uh, it was interesting, like I thought it was an extraordinarily narcissistic display, but, but despite that, there's something symbolically appropriate about it. I also, there's a, a movie I really like, sadly enough, called Fubar. I don't know how many of you have seen that. <laughs> yeah, you know that movie, I take it. <laughs> yeah, it's about the people I grew up with. So, yeah, that's true, man, I'm telling you, that's true. So the, the guy, the main actor in FUBAR, who's quite bright but completely uncivilized, gets testicular cancer, and there's one great scene where he gets far too drunk and he's stumbling around the street, you know, in, in a virtually comatose state. And, of course, he's not very thrilled with what's happened to him, and he's shaking his fist at the sky. It's pouring rain, and he's cursing God. And, you know, it's like, well, you can kind of understand his position. So... That kind of reminded me of these people who were yelling at the sky, you know, they were basically, they were act dramatizing the idea of, enra they were enraged at, well, you could say God, of course, most of them wouldn't say that, but, but they were the ones yelling at the damn sky, I mean, <laughs> you know, so you gotta, you gotta look at what they're doing rather than what they say, and they were outraged that being was constructed such that Trump could have arisen as president, and so, well, so this idea you know, that we can be easily turned against being and work for its destruction is a really, it's a really common, common, common theme. It never goes away. You see it echoed in stories like with the new Marvel series, for example. You see the enmity between Thor and Loki. That's a good example of the same thing. Or between Batman and the Joker. There's, there's, or Superman and Lex Luthor. These, there, there's these pairs of uh, hero against villain that's a really dramatic and easily what everyone can understand that dynamic right it's a basic plot and the reason it's a basic plot is because it's true of the battle within our spirits our own individual spirits it's true within families because sibling rivalry can be unbelievably brutal it's true between human beings who are strangers it's true between groups of people like it's true at every level of analysis and then in some sense it's it's archetypally true at least with regards to deep religious symbolism because you see that echoed in many stories as well so I think the clearest representation is probably Christ and Satan that's the closest to a pure archetype although there's in the old Egyptian stories there's Osiris and Seth or Horus and Seth and Seth is a precursor to Satan etymologically so it's a very, very common motif, and so that's what happens again in Rebecca's womb, is that this thing, this idea is played out right away, and the two, the two twins are actually, what would you call it there? They have a, a superordinate destiny, because one of them is destined to become the father of Israel, and of course that's a pinnacle moment in the Old Testament, obviously, and arguably, a pinnacle moment in human history. Now, you know, the degree to which the stories in the Old Testament actually constitute what we would consider empirical history is a matter of debate. But it, it doesn't matter in some sense because 
as I mentioned, I think, before in this lecture series, you know, there are, there are forms of fiction that are meta-true, which means that they're not necessarily about a specific individual, although I, I generally think they are based on the life of specific individuals. It's the simplest theory, but who knows, right? But they're, they're more real than reality itself because they abstract out the most relevant elements of reality and present them to you. And that's why you watch fiction. You, know, you, don't, you, want, you want your fiction boiled down, right? You want it boiled down to the essence. That's what makes good fiction. And that essence is something that's truer than, than plain old truth if it's handled well. And so, you know, if you watch a Shakespeare play, half a lifetime of events can go by in a Shakespeare play. And, and, and it covers, you know, a wide range of scenes and so on. And, and so it's, it's cut and edited and compressed all at once. But because of that, it blasts you with, with a kind of emotional and ethical force just the mere videotaping of someone's daily life you know, wouldn't, even, wouldn't even come close to approximating. So, and this motif of the hostile brothers, that's a, that's a deep, deep archetypal truth. And God says to Rachel, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and one people shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. And so there's an inversion there, right? Because as we've discussed, historically speaking and traditionally speaking, it's the elder son that, to whom the disproportionate blessings flow. Um, there's some truth in that too, even more, uh, what would you say, more empirically, IQ tends to decrease as the number of children in the family increase. The younger, the oldest, is the smartest, generally speaking. It isn't clear why that is, but it might be that they get more attention. But who knows? So those of you who are younger can be very unhappy about that fact. <laughs> <laughs> now Jacob, okay, so there's another, there's another plot line here too, because um, uh, Abraham and, and Rebecca are at odds Sorry, Isaac and Rebecca are at odds about the children, right? So there's, a, there's an Oedipal twist to it too because, well, Isaac is allied with Esau who turns out to be the hunter type. So he's your basic rough and tumble character, you know, and he's kind of a wild looking guy, hairy, and he likes to be outside. He lives in tents. He likes to hunt. He's a man's man. That's one way of thinking about it. Whereas Jacob dwells in tents, you know, he doesn't go outside much, he's more, well, maybe he's more introverted, but he's certainly this sort of kid, adolescent, say, who hangs around home, and it, there's some intimation that he's his mother, well, he's clearly his mother's favorite, and with all the advantages, and, and I suppose disadvantages that go along with that, and Isaac and Rebecca don't see eye to eye about who should have predominance among the sons, and Rebecca is quite complicit with Jacob in inverting the social order. So the first thing that happens that's crooked is that Esau comes in from hunting and he's, you know, maybe he's been out for a number of days and he's ravenous and he's kind of an impulsive guy. He doesn't really seem to think about the long term very much. And Jacob was cooking some lentil stew and... Uh, Esau wants some of it, and Jacob refuses, and, and then says that he'll trade his, his birthright for it. And uh, Esau agrees, which is a bad deal, right? It's a bad deal. And so you, you could say that Esau actually deserves what's coming to him, although at minimum you'd have to think of them both as being equally culpable. It's a nasty trick. And so... That's Jacob's first trick. And then the second trick is that, and it's later, and Isaac is old and blind and, you know, close to death. And it's time for him to bestow a blessing on his sons, which is a very important event, apparently, among these ancient people. Um, and Esau, again, is out hunting, and Rachel dress, dresses Jacob up in a hairy 
puts a goat skin on his arm so he's kind of hairy like Esau and dresses him in Esau's clothes so he smells like Esau. And Isaac tells Esau to go out and hunt him up some, some venison, I think it is, and, uh, which is a favorite of his. And Rebecca has Jacob cook up a couple of goat kids and serve that to Isaac and play the role of Esau. And so he does that. It's pretty na- damn nasty, really, all things considered, you know, to play a trick like that, both on your brother and on your blind father, and in collusion with your mother. It's not the sort of thing that's really designed to promote a lot of familial harmony. And so, especially because you've already screwed him over in a big way once, you know, you'd think, you'd think that would be sufficient. So, anyways, he's successful, and Esau loses his father's blessing, and so that Jacob ends up really in the position of the firstborn. And it's quite interesting because, you know, God tells Rachel that Jacob is going to be the dominant twin. And you'd think again with God's blessing, or at least the prophecy, that Jacob would end up being a good guy. But he's certainly not presented that way to begin with, which is also quite interesting given that he's the eventual founder of Israel. And it's another indication of the realism of these old stories, you know, and it's, it's quite amazing to me, it's always been quite amazing to me how unprettified these stories have remained. You know, because you'd think that if you're even the least bit cynical, especially if you had the kind of Marxist religion is the opiate of the masses kind of viewpoint, which, which is a credible viewpoint, you know, although it's wrong, but it's, cre- well, I, I think it's a shallow, I think it's a shallow interpretation. And a part of the reason I think it's a shallow interpretation is because the stories would be a lot prettier if that was the case. These characters wouldn't have this strange realistic moral ambiguity about them. You know, if you're going to feed people a fantasy, then it, you want it to be like a Harlequin novel or, 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 or a greeting card or something like that. You don't want it to be a, a story that's full of betrayal and deceit and murder and mayhem and genocide and all of that. That just doesn't seem all that, what would you say, calming, I guess would be the right, right answer. So anyways... Jacob gets away with this, but Esau is not happy, and and Jacob is quite convinced that he might kill him. And I think that was a reasonable fear, because Esau was a tough guy, and he was used to being outside, and he knew how to hunt, and he knew how to kill, and he actually wasn't very happy about getting seriously screwed over by his, you know, stay-at-home younger brother twice. And so Jacob runs off and goes to visit his uncle. And on the way, and this is a very interesting part of the story, he stops and to sleep, and he takes a stone for a pillow, and then he has this vision. It's called a dream, but the context makes it look like a vision of a ladder reaching up to heaven and with angels moving up and down the, the ladder, let's say. And uh, there's some representations of that. I showed you some of them the last time we met, but... I'll read it to you first. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and the south. So that lays out the canonical directions, right? So now there's a center with the canonical directions. Like the thing that you see, you know, that little symbol you see on maps? It's the same thing that symbolically placed upon the earth. So a center has been established with radiating, uh, well, with with what? With, With directional lines radiating from it. So it establishes it as, as a place. And in the end, thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So that's pretty good news for Jacob. And it's not self-evident why God is rewarding him for running away after screwing over his brother. But that seems to be what happens. And so here's a couple of representations, classic representations. Um, The one on the right is William Blake. It's one I particularly like. You know, and Blake assimilates God with the sun and with light, right? So... That's quite a common mythological idea, that, that God is associated with light. 
and the day. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, which is exactly the right response, and said, How dreadful is this place! It is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And that's, that's a more important thing than you think. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more deeply because up to this point in the story, there isn't anything really, there isn't anything that's really emerged to mark a sacred space, right? There's no, there's no cathedral, there's no church, there's nothing like that. But here's this idea that emerges that you can mark the center of something that, and that's important, and you mark it with a stone. And a stone's a good way to mark things that, that are important because a stone is permanent, right? And we mark things with stones now, like we mark graves with stones, for example, because we want to make a memory and to carve something into stone, to carve a stone and then to carve something into stone is to make a memory, and to use stone is to make a memory because stone is permanent. And to set it upright is to, to indicate a center. And so... That's what happens, and pours oil on the top of it, which is a kind of offering. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, then a tenth of what I earn I will give him. I missed that. Um, That's interesting, too, because now there's a transformation of sacrifice, right? Because until that point, sacrifices have, had been pretty concretized. It was the burning of something. Whereas here, all of a sudden, it's the offering of, 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 of productive labor per se, like a tithe, because a tithe is a form of sacrifice. And so there's an abstraction of the idea of sacrifice. Now, sacrifice, it's really important that the idea of sacrifice gets abstracted, right? Because it should be abstracted to the point where it's it's used the way that we use it today, which is, you know, we make sacrifices to get ahead, and everyone understands what that means. But the sacrifices are generally some combination of psychological and, and, and practical. So we're not acting them out. We're, precisely, we're not dramatizing them or ritualizing them. We actually act them out in, our, in the covenant that we make with the future. And we do that well, unless we're extraordinarily impulsive and aimless in our lives and have really no conception whatsoever of the future and are likely to sacrifice the future for the present, which is what Esau does, right, then we make sacrifices. And you've got to think, like, the idea of making sacrifices to make the future better is an extraordinarily difficult lesson to learn. It took people, God only knows how long, to learn that. You know, like, we, we have no idea... It's not something that animals do easily. Chimpanzees don't store leftover meat. You know, they just, and neither do wolves. They just, a wolf can eat about 30 pounds of meat in one sitting. And that's that's where the idea of wolfing it down comes from. They're not hiding it, saving it for later. You know, they can't do that. So they can't sacrifice the present for the future. So this is a big deal that that this happens. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the idea of the pillar because it's, it's an unbelievably deep idea, and it orients us in ways that we still don't... It still orients in us in ways that we don't understand. And in fact, it's actually the mechanism by which we're oriented. Or, and if it's lacking, then we become disoriented. And so I'll show you some pictures and describe them first. Okay, so first of all, there's a walled city. So let, let me tell you, that you could think about that as an archetypal human habitation. Maybe it's a reflection of something like a fire in the middle of the plain or the forest, or the jungle for that matter, although it's kind of hard to get a fire going there. Imagine a fire ringed around with logs and perhaps ringed around with dwellings, right? So the fire's in the center, and the fire defines the center, and then as you move away from the fire, you move out into the darkness, right? So the fire is light, and communion and safety, and as you move away from the fire, you move out into 
the darkness and what's terrifying out beyond the perimeter. So what's beyond the perimeter is terrifying. You can feel that if you go camping somewhere that's wild. You know, you're pretty damn happy, especially if the wolves are howling. You're pretty damn happy to be sitting by the fire because you can see there, the fire keeps the animals away. And, you know, if you do wander into the bush, into the darkness, then you're on alert. And, you know, your predator detection systems are on alert. And so you could think about the classical human habitation as two places, one where your predator detection system isn't on alert and another where your predator te detection system is alert, on alert. And you could think about that roughly as the distinction between explored territory and unexplored territory. And really the, the founding of a place is precisely, this is a lot of this I got from reading Mircea Eliade, the founding of a place is precisely the definition of a an explored center set against the unexplored periphery. And, you know, what's interesting about that, so you can kind of think about that with regards to the walled city, right? Everything in the wall is cosmos, and everything outside the wall is chaos. And, you know, but it also extends to the conceptual realm, because imagine that you're the master of a field of study, and so that's an interesting metaphor because a field is a, a geographical metaphor, right? And if in the center of the field are those things that everyone knows really well, the axioms that everyone uh, abides by in the field, and then as you move towards the fringes, you get toward, towards the unknown, towards the frontier of the discipline. And as you become expert, you move from the center to the frontier. And so then you're on the border when you're, when, you're, when you're a scholar, a competent scholar, you're on the border between the unexplored or the explored and the unexplored, and you're trying to further that border. So even if you're just doing this abstractly, it's the same thing. And it's a reflection of the fact that every human environment, concrete or abstract, it makes no difference, recapitulates the cosmos chaos dichotomy or the order chaos dichotomy. And that's why in Taoism, for example, it's the union of chaos and order that constitutes being itself and that you stand on the border between chaos and order because that's the proper place to be. Too orderly, too much in the explored, you're not learning anything. Too much out there where the predators lurk, then you're frozen with terror. And neither of those positions are desirable. So... And that's what, you know, and so you think, and this is a concrete reality, obviously, as well as a psychological reality. There were reasons for those walls, right? Because inside the walls were all the people like us. And so that begs the question, what does it mean for people to be like us? And then outside the wall, there was all those people because they were the worst forms of predators because people are actually the worst forms of predators who aren't like us. And the wall is there to draw a distinction between like us and not like us. And so, and that was a matter of life and death. You, you can tell that because, I mean, look at those walls. They had to build those by hand. And, you know, you do see walled cities that have three rings of walls. So these people were terrified, but not so terrified as the people who built three walls. They were really terrified. And they had their reasons. So, okay, so... Now, <clears throat> there's an idea that's, that's reflected in the Jacob's Ladder story, that the center <clears throat> where you put the pillar is also the place where heaven and earth touch. And so that's, that's a complicated idea. I, th I think that you can, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at these stories from a psychological perspective. And so then you could say that that's a symbolic place where the lowest and the highest come together. And so it's a place where earthly being stretches up to the highest possible ethical abstraction. And that's the center because one of the things that defines us, say, as opposed to them, is that we're all united within a certain ethic. That's what makes us the same. This is a complicated line of reasoning, and, and, but I'll go back to it after I show you some more pictures. But So that's, that's the first idea, is that the center 
is the place where the lowest and the highest touch simultaneously. And so you could say that in some sense it specifies the aim of a group of people. That's another way. You know, if you get together with people to make a group, even at work, you group yourself around a project, and that unites you, and it unites you because you all have the same aim. You're all pointing to the same thing. And that makes you the same in some ways, because if you're after the same thing I am, then the same things are going to be important to you that are important to me. And the same things are going to be negative to you that are negative to me, because our emotions work out that way. And that means I can instantly predict you. I know how you're going to behave. And so our aim, which is basically our ethical aim, it's because we're aiming at something better, at least in principle, we're aiming at something better. It's our ethical aim that unites our perceptions, and that's what aligns our emotions. And so that sort of begs the question, if you're going to build a community, around what aim should the community congregate? Okay, so the idea here is that the, the center of the community is the pillar that unites heaven and earth, so it unites the lowest with the highest. So there's some intimation of the idea that it's the highest that unites the community. Okay, and so... Keep that in mind. And that's a very old idea as well. That's the idea of the axis mundi, which is the center pole that unites heaven and earth. It's an unbelievably old idea. Tens of thousands of years old. It might even stretch back to whatever our archaic memories, quasi-memories, I don't know what you would describe them, archetypal memories of our excessively old ancestry in trees, when the tree itself was, in fact, the center of the world, and that it was ringed by snakes and chaos. And so, well, we have no idea how old these ideas are, but they're very, very old. And evolution is a conservative business. Once it builds a gadget, then it builds new things on top of that gadget. It's like a medieval town, right? The center of the town is really old, and new, newer areas of the town get built around it, but the center is still really old, and that's what we're like, you know. Our, our, our platforms, like our, our basic physiological structure, this, this skeletal body, is some tens of millions of years old, or older than that. If you think about vertebrates, it's much older than that, and that's all conserved. So, everything's built on top of everything else. All right, so there, there's a kind of a classic town and there's the idea, I showed you this, this Scandinavian world tree, same idea, it unites heaven and earth, and around the roots of that tree are snakes that eat this tree constantly, so that's the idea that there's stability, but there's constant transformation around that stability, and at the same time the snakes are gnawing on the roots, there's streams that are nourishing it, so it's sort of, it's sort of an echo of the idea that life depends on death and renewal constantly because your cells are dying and, and being renewed constantly, right? If they are just proliferating, then you have cancer. If they're just dying, then you die. It, you have to get the balance between death and life exactly right so that you can actually live, which is also a very strange thing. So, and that tree is something that reaches from the bottom layers of being, maybe the microcosm, all the way to the macrocosm. That's the idea anyways. So, then there's, okay, so there's, there's uh, Jacob and his, and his pillar. He's got this idea that you can mark the center with this stone. Like, it sort of symbolizes what he was laying on when he dreamt, but now he's got this idea. You put something erect, and it marks the center, and it symbolizes his vision of the highest good, something like that, and the promise that's been made to him. And then this is an Egyptian obelisk, with a pyramid on top of it, um, that's in Paris. It was taken from Luxor and it put in Paris. And so that's a much more sophisticated instance of the same idea. Okay, and there was a Stone Age cultures across Eurasia that put up these huge obelisks everywhere. These huge, like the Stonehenge is a good example of that, although it's, it's very sophisticated. And they were also markers of places. We don't know exactly what their function is, but they're very much akin to this, some permanent marker of place. There's a good one. So that's in St. Peter's, and I really like this one because you can see the echoes of Jacob's vision for the establishment of a territory there, right? You've got the obelisk in the middle, and then you've got the directions radiating from the center. And, of course, St. Peter's, this is the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which is an absolutely unbelievable place. It's just 
jaw-dropping. And so there's the cathedral at the back of it, and then there's this circle of pillars that surrounds it. You can just see them a little bit on the, on the middle left there. That goes all the way around that entire enclosure. And, uh, you know, a very large number of people can gather there. And then, so that pillar marks the center, and that would be the center of Catholicism, essentially. That's what that represents, right? The, the symbolic center of Catholicism. Although you could make the case that the cathedral is the center. It doesn't really matter. They're very close together, and it's, it's half a dozen of one and six of the other. And then here's another representation of the same idea, right? Is that this is why people don't like the flag to be burned, you know, because conservative people see the flag as the sacred thing that binds people together. And so they're not happy when that sacred thing is destroyed, even if it's destroyed in the name of protest, whereas the people who burn flags think, well, there are times to dramatize the idea that the center has been corrupt, and you can demonstrate that by putting it to the torch, you know, as a representation that, that, this, that the corrupt center now has to be burned and transformed. And the thing is, they're both right. They're both right all the time because the center is absolutely necessary and is sacred and is almost always also corrupt and in need of reparation. That's also an archetypal idea. And, and that's a useful thing to know because, you know, it's easy for young people in particular to think that, well, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and it's the fault of the last generation. They've left us this terrible mess and, you know, we're feeling pretty betrayed about that and now we have to clean it up. It's like, yeah, yeah, people have been thinking that for like 35,000 years. It's not new. And, and the reason it's not new is because it's always true. You know, what you're handed is a sacred center with flaws. Always, always. And it's partly because it's the creation of the dead, right? And the dead can't see and they can't communicate and so they're not in touch with the present and so what they've bequeathed to you apart from the fact that it might actually be corrupt which is a slightly different thing is at least blind and dead and so what the hell can you expect from something that's blind and dead you know you're lucky if it just doesn't stomp you out of existence so so that's a, a lovely photograph obviously and and that's the establishment of a new center and then the, the center can be a cathedral, too, and often is. Of course, in, in classic towns, European towns in particular, although it's not only European towns that are like this, there, there's a center that's made out of stone, so that would be the cathedral, and it's got the highest tower, and on top of the tower there's often a cross, and that's the symbolic center. So people are, are drawn together around whatever the cross represents. Now, the, the cross obviously represents a center, because it's an X, right? X marks the spot. So the center of the cross is the center. And then the cathedral is often in a cross shape, which also marks the center. And then in the cathedral, there's a dome often, and that's the sky, and that's that ladder that reaches from earth to heaven. So it's a recapitulation of the same idea. So, and people are, are drawn to that center. And the center is the symbol of what unites them, and what unites them is the faith that the cathedral is the embodiment of. And you think, well, what does the faith mean? And again, we're approaching this psychologically, and what it means is that we, everyone who's a member of that group accepts the transcendent ideal of the group. Now, the thing is, if you're the member of a group, you accept the transcendent ideal of the group. That's what it means to be a member of a group. So if you're in a work team and you're all working on a project, what you've essentially done is decided that you're going to make the goal unquestionable, right? I mean, you might argue about the details, but if you're tasked with something, you know, here's a job for you 10 people, organize yourself around the job. You can argue about how you're going to do the job, but you can't argue about the job. Then the group falls apart. And so there's an act of faith in some sense. <laughs> the reason that the act of faith is necessary is because it's very, very difficult to specify without error what that central aim should be given that there's any number of aims, right? And it's a very, very difficult thing to figure out, and this is something we're going to do a little bit tonight, is, like, what should the aim be around which a group would congregate? You know, that, so, so, especially if it's a large group, and it's a large group that has to stay together across very large swaths of time, and the group is in incredibly diverse, you know? What possible kind of ideal could unite 
a large group of diverse people across a very large stretch of time? That's a really, really hard question, and I think part of the way that question has been answered is it's been answered symbolically and, and in images because it's so damn complicated that it's almost impossible to articulate. So, but obviously you need to have a center around which everyone can unite because if you don't, then everyone's at odds with one another. Like if I don't know what you're up to and you don't know what he's up to, we have no, we're just strangers and we don't know that our ethics match at all, then the probability that we're going to be able to exist harmoniously decreases rapidly to zero. And, and that's obviously just no good. That's a state of total chaos. So we can't have that. It's, it's not possible to exist without a central ideal. It's not possible. And it, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that, partly because it's... I don't, I'll try to get this right. This is the sort of thing that I was arguing with Sam Harris about. Um, you see, your category system is a product of your aims. That's the thing. Like, if you have a set of facts at hand, the facts don't tell you how to categorize the facts. Because there's too damn many facts. There's a, a trillion facts. And there's no way, without imposing some a priori order on them, of determining how it is that you should order them. So how do you order them? Well, that's easy. You decide what you're aiming at. Now, how do you do that? Well, I'm not answering that question at the moment. I'm just saying that in order to organize those facts, you need an aim. And then the aim instantly organizes the facts into those things relevant to the aim, tools, let's say, those things that get in the way, and a very large number of things that you don't have to pay attention to at all. Right? It excludes... Ver like, if you're working on an engineering problem, you don't have to worry about... Uh, uh, practicing medicine in your neighborhood. You don't, there's a bunch of, like if you're focusing on a particular, uh, what would you say? Any, any job, any, any set of skills implies that you're good at a small set of things and then not good at an incredibly large number of other skills. It simplifies things. And so you can use your aim as the basis of a category structure. And so you, you also have to keep that in mind because what it means is, as far as I can tell, that what it means is that your category system itself, which is what structures your perceptions, is actually dependent on the ethics of your aim. It's directly, it's a moral thing. It's directly dependent on your aim. And that's a stunning idea if it happens to be true. It's not how people think about thinking. We don't think that way. We, like we think that we think deterministically, let's say, or that we think empirically, or that we think rationally. And none of that appears to be the case. What we do is we posit a valid aim, and then we organize the world around the aim. And there's plenty of evidence from that in, in, in psychological studies of perception, right? That, that does look like how the, the, the perceptual systems work. Mostly they ignore, because the world's too complicated. They focus on a small set of phenomena deemed relevant to whatever the aim is. And then, of course, the aim is problematic. Again, it's complex because the aim I have has to be an aim that some of you at share or at least don't object to, because otherwise I'm not going to get anywhere with my damn aim. It has to actually be implementable in the world. It has to be sustainable across at least some amount of time. It can't kill me. Like, it's really hedged in, this aim. It's, it isn't any old thing. There's hardly any things that it can be. So, you know, Jacob's aim, for example, in undermining Esau almost gets him killed. And you can understand why. That's the other thing. You think, well, that, that was a nasty bit of work. You can understand Esau's rage. It's, even though we're separated from the people in these stories by, what, 4,000 years, 3,000 years, something like that, you know in, immediately why everyone feels the way they do, at least once you understand the context of the story, that none of that's mysterious in the least. So, so there's the church, and the church is underneath the cross. Right, and so that's St. Peter's Basilica. And so there's the cross on the globe on top of the basilica, and then there's the cross on the uh, obelisk as well. And so what that means is that, and this is where things get insanely complicated, is that the center is defined by whatever the cross represents. 
Now, the cross represents a crossing point geographically. It's, it's certainly that. The cross probably represents the body to some degree. But then the cross also represents the place of suffering, obviously. And more importantly, it, it represents the place of voluntary suffering transcended. I'm speaking psychologically, right? Not theologically. That's what it represents. And so you might say, so here's the idea behind putting down the obelisk with the cross and saying that that's the center. So that's the thing that everyone's aiming at. And so the, the idea would be, well, if you're going to be a member of the group defined by this obelisk, then what you do is accept your position at the center of suffering voluntarily and therefore transcend it. That's the idea. And that is one hell of an idea. It really is, man. That is a killer idea. Because it's actually a signal, it's a really clear signal of psychological health. You know, because one of the things you do if you're a clinical psychologist and someone is paralyzed by fear is what you do is you break their fears down into relatively manageable bits and then you have them voluntarily confront their fears. And it, it might also be things that they're disgusted by, say, if they have obsessive compulsive disorder, but it produces very strong negative emotion, whatever it is. And then you have them voluntarily confront whatever it is that produces that overwhelming negative emotion and that makes them stronger. That's what happens. It doesn't make them less afraid. It makes them more courageous and stronger, and that is not the same thing. It's seriously not. It doesn't decrease the fear. It increases the courage. And so that's a mind-boggling idea. And it's deeper. You know, one of the things that's really interesting about these archetypal ideas is that, and maybe it's partly because of the hyperlinked nature of the Bible, that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing, is that no matter how deep you dig into them, you'll never get to the bottom. You know, you hit a bottom, you think, God, that's so unbelievably profound. And then if you excavate a little underneath that, you find something else that's even more profound. And you think, wow, that's got to be the bottom. And then you dig under that, it's like, there's no bottom. You can just keep digging down. Well, as far as I can tell, you can keep digging down layer after layer. And we'll talk a little bit about more, a little more about what the cross signifies as the center. Because you see, what people were trying to figure out is... What is it that we need to unite under, right? What's the proper thing to unite under? I can give you another example. So in the Mesopotamian societies, the emperor, um, you know, who was more or less an, an absolute monarch, he li lived inside what was essentially a walled city. And the, the god of the Mesopotamians was Marduk. And Marduk was the figure who had eyes all the way around his head and he spoke magic words. So he was very attentive and very articulate. And it was Marduk who went out and, and confronted the goddess of chaos, the dragon of chaos, and cut her into pieces and made up the world. Okay, so you can kind of understand what that means. So Marduk goes beyond the frontier into the place of predatory chaos and encounters the thing that's terrifying and then makes something productive out of it. So it's a hero myth. And, and Marduk is elected to the position of preeminent god by all the other Mesopotamian gods because he manages that. So the, the Marduk idea emerges up the holy dominance hierarchy and hits the pinnacle. So that, and God only knows how long that took. It would be the amalgamation of many tribes and then the... the what? The... The distillation of all those tribal myths to produce this emergent story of what constitutes top god. And then the job of the emperor was to act out Marduk. That's what gave him sovereignty. So the reason that he was the center around which people organized themselves wasn't because he was, when he was being a proper emperor, it wasn't because there was something super special about him. Like the power didn't exactly reside in him which is a really useful thing to separate, right? You want the power, which is why it's kind of nice to have a, a symbolic monarch. You get the symbolic power separated from the personality power, right? Because otherwise they get conflated. That's what happened in Rome. It's a very, and, it, and it, you, know, you can see it tending to happen now and then in the US, like with the Kennedy dynasties and that sort of thing. So the idea was the emperor had sovereignty as long as he was acting out Marduk properly and going out into the chaos and cutting it into pieces and making order. That was his job. So they used to take him outside the city on the New Year's festival and strip him of all his emperor garments and humiliate him and then force him to, to uh, confess all the ways that year he hadn't been a good Marduk. So he wasn't a good ruler. 
And so that was supposed to clue them in and wake them up, right? And then they would ritually reenact the battle of Marduk against Tiamat, the chaos monster, using statues. And then if that all went well, then the emperor would go back in and the city would be renewed for another year. And we still have echoes of that in our New Year's celebration, right? It's the same idea that's echoed down all those, all those centuries, thousands of years. So it's a, such a staggeringly brilliant idea, right? Because, so part of the idea is that the thing that's sovereign, so that's the pillar at the center that, that everyone gathers around, is at least in part the thing that courageously goes out into the unknown and makes something useful out, out of it for the community. So, that's very, very smart. It's very smart. So this is another example of a center. So these, this is the flag, this is the Union Jack, and so it's made up of a bunch of crosses, right? And so the first cross, the English cross, that's the flag of St. George, that's the flag of England. And Saint, what does St. George do? Slays the dragon, exactly. Same idea, right? So St. George, patron saint of England, goes out and slays the dragon and frees the virgin from the grip of the dragon. Same idea, right? So that's the center. And then the second cross is called a, a Celtier, but it's another crucifix. So it's the cross on which St. Andrew was crucified. So it's the same idea. It's the, the center is the center of suffering voluntarily undertaken, because St. Andrew was a martyr. And then St. Patrick is the third cross. What did St. Patrick do in Ireland? Chased out all the snakes. Right, so it's the same thing, right? And so the flag of Great Britain is the combination of all of these three crosses that defines the center, and that's what the flag is. So that symbolizes all of that. So that's, you know, completely mind-boggling. So, and there's more about St. Patrick, too. So, he banishes the snakes after a 40-day fast, and so that's a, an allusion to the 40 years that Moses spends in the desert, and also the 40 days that Christ fasts in the New Testament. And his walking stick, when he plants it, grows into a tree, so that echoes all of the ideas about the center that we just described. And he also speaks with the ancient Irish ancestors, which, if you remember, is a characteristic of the shamanic rituals where where, so in the typical shamanic ritual, which seems to be elicited by psychedelic use, the shaman dissolve down past their bones, and then they go up into heaven and speak with the ancestors, and then they're introduced into the heavenly kingdom, and then the flesh is put back on their bones, and they come back and tell everybody what happened. And that's a repeatable experience, right? The shamanic tradition is unbelievably widespread. So all over Europe, ancient Europe and Asia, and perhaps as far down as South America, right? It's highly conserved, and it's out of that tradition in all likelihood that our religious ideation emerged. So, and you can see echoes of that here. So, so back to the story of Jacob and his ladder so that I can come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So that's, that's also an echo, I would say, of the obligation of those who climb the power hierarchy to attend to those who are at the bottom, right? Because if you think about the tithing as a form of wealth distribution, which is essentially what it is, the part of the ethic that defines the proper moral endeavor that's related to that center is not to advance yourself at the expense of the entire community. So if you're, if you're fortunate enough so that you can rise in, in authority and power and competence within the confines of a community, you still have an obligation to maintain the structure, maintain and further the structure of the community within which you rose. And that's obvious, right? Because if people didn't do that after a couple of generations, the whole thing would fall apart. So, you know, you, 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 it's, it's not reasonable to destroy the game that you're winning. It's reasonable to strengthen the game that you're winning. And so, so that's another thing, because that also describes the ethic that should allow you to be an active member of the community around which that that gathers around that center. So, so, so 
one of the things I've learned about the hero mythology that I really, really like is, so you see this pretty clearly in the figure of Christ, but because two things are conjoined in, in that story, but Christ is also the hero, there's two kinds of heroes. Eh? There's the hero that goes out into chaos and confronts the dragon of chaos and gathers the, the treasure as a consequence and then shares it with the community. That's, that's, that's one. The other form of hero is the hero who stands up against the corrupt state and rattles the foundation of the state, has it collapse, and then reconstructs it, right? So, because the two great dangers to human beings are un protected exposure to the catastrophes of the natural world and subjugation to tyranny, right? Those are the two major dangers. And so a hero is, their ultimate hero is the person who reconstructs the structure of the state by using the information that he gathered by going out into the unknown. That unites them both. And so what that means, here's the, here's the rub, as far as I can tell. So a structure, a center, has two risks associated with it. One is that it will degenerate into chaos, and the other is it will rigidify into tyranny. And it'll degenerate into chaos even if it just stays doing what it's doing. So if it just does exactly what it's doing and it doesn't change, it will degenerate. Because things change, and if it doesn't change to keep up, then it gets farther and farther away from the environment, and it'll precipitously collapse. And so, and then if it just changes willy-nilly so that nobody can establish a, a stable, centralizing aim, then it degenerates into chaos immediately and no one can get along. So, there's a rule for belonging to the community and the rule has to be to, that you have to act in a manner that sustains and that sustains the community and increases its competence. That's the fundamental moral obligation for belonging. Well, and obviously so, right? Because why would you belong to a... Why would you walk into a clubhouse that was on fire? Like, that's just not smart, right? If you're going to be part of the game, it, if you've decided that being part of the game is worthwhile, you've also taken on the moral... You've also decided, even if you didn't notice it, that you have to work to support that game, because by deciding to play that game, you've said that it's valuable. And if it's valuable, then obviously you should work to sustain and expand it because that's the definition of having a relationship with something that's valuable. And so that's the criteria for membership in the community. And that's partly why if you regard the cross, say, as the symbol of voluntary suffering, you know, suffering accepted voluntarily, something like that, which is, means that there's another element of that too that's worth thinking about. So, you know, the reason that Cain gets so out of hand is because he's suffering and he won't accept it. He certainly won't accept responsibility for it. He's angry and bitter about it. And no wonder, right? I mean, we have to be realistic about these sorts of things. There, you guys, all of you people are going to suffer at some point in your life to the point where you're angry and bitter about it. I mean, there's just absolutely no doubt about that. And you're even going to think, well, it's no bloody wonder that I'm angry and bitter about it. Everyone would be, and things are so god-awful that there's no excuse for them to even exist. And, like, that's a powerful argument, although I think it's ultimately self-defeating. Well, that's kind of what the story of Cain and Abel... That's kind of what the story of Cain and Abel... What would you say? That's the moral of the story of Cain and Abel, essentially. So what that means instead is that even under those conditions of relatively intense suffering, you have to accept it voluntarily, because otherwise it turns you against being. And then you start to act in this terrible manner that makes everything worse. And it seems to me that there's a contradiction in that. If, if the reason you're complaining is that things are bad, then it isn't reasonable for you to act in a manner that makes them worse. Right? I mean, even if it's no wonder that people do that, but it's, it's a degenerating game. And so that's... So the, the idea, part of the idea of the cross and the suffering that it represents is that if you can accept that voluntarily, regardless of its intensity, then you won't become embittered and resentful and vengeful to the point where you pose a danger to the stability of the community. 
So, or to your own stability, for that matter, because it's, you know, it might be your own stability, the stability of your family, the stability of the community, and the stability of the world. It might be all of that. And increasingly, I think it is all of that. So, okay, so... Now, Jacob, we get the second part of Jacob's story. He goes to meet his uncle, Laban, and... Uh, he meets Rachel there, again, by a well. He falls in love and goes to live with Laban. There are two daughters there, Leah as well as Rachel. Leah is not a particularly attractive person. It isn't exactly clear why, but the story makes it quite clear. She's definitely the least desirable of the two daughters. And the, the story makes reference to her eyes, and it isn't clear if there's something wrong with her physiologically or if there's something wrong with her attitude, it's not obvious, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, she's the older daughter, but she's the less desirable one. Um, Jacob stays a month, which is the limit of hospitality in, in that time. If you stayed for a month, you were welcome, but you had to work for your keep, I think after about three days, something like that, which seems rather reasonable. And so, he stays a month, and then... He has a chat with Laban, and he says, he's, he's fallen in love with Rachel by this time, and he says, uh, I'll stay with you and work for seven years, and then I'll wed Rachel. If, and Laban says, that's a fine deal. And then the seven years passes, and there's a wedding ceremony. It's quite a long thing, and the bride is veiled, and um, the, the bride goes into the tent with with Jacob, and if I remember the story correctly, I haven't looked at it for a month or so, Rachel is outside the tent speaking, but Leah is inside the tent. And so Jacob thinks he's getting married to Rachel, but he's actually getting married to Leah. And this is, it's an inversion, eh? Because he's in the dark like Isaac was when he fooled Isaac. So now it's Jacob's turn to be in the dark. And he gets betrayed by his uncle and his bride-to-be, Rachel, and her sister, in a manner that's broadly parallel to the trick that he pulled on Esau. And so there's a karma notion there, which I, which I like. You know, I mean, you might think of karma as a superstitious idea, but, and there are ways of interpreting it that might make it the case, but I don't think that's what it is. It's that... No bad deed goes unpunished. It's something like that. It's like, you know, maybe you've done something bad to someone and therefore there's part of you that feels quite guilty about that, hopefully. And <laughs> that part is looking for punishment to set the stage right. And you might think, well, no, but things are... Yes, unless you're a psychopath, that's how things work. If you're interested in that kind of thing, you should read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment because it's the definitive study of that sort of phenomena, right? Because in that book, the main protagonist, Raskolnikov, gets away with murder. Like, he does it successfully, no one suspects him. And he drives himself so crazy with guilt that he basically falls into the hands of the police. He drives himself into the hands of the police because he can't tolerate what he did. It's very, it's amazing, it's an amazing book. But anyways, the point is here, Jacob falls prey to the same sort of crookedness that he used to ratchet himself up the ladder. And that happens far more often in life than people think. And it's really not like he can complain about it, right? Not if he has any sense, it's like he does. He brings Leah out to see Laban and he says, what's... <laughs> What's with this sister? You know, and Laban basically says to him, um, in our culture, it's the custom to marry the eldest daughter first, which is exactly right. And he said, well, it would bring, you know, he's rationalizing, obviously, because he's just screwed over Jacob in a major way. But it's a little late to take it back. The, the marriage has been consummated and the ceremony has been complete and all hell would break out if there was any attempt to sever the relationship. So that's how it is. So Leah's married and Jacob has the wrong wife. So then 
So this is Jacob there. <laughs> you see on the left, he's got the little flowery hat, and he's pointing to Leah, and he's saying, like, what, what's up here? <laughs> and <laughs> and Laban, you know, Laban, he's a tough old goat, and he's not really all that sad about it. In fact, you can imagine that he's kind of going, <laughs> so... So, okay, then he has to work another seven years. And he gains Rachel. But, because God is a tricky character, um, there's another twist in this story. Rachel turns out not to be very good at having children. Or Rachel and Jacob turn out not to be very good at having children. But Leah, <clears throat> she's really good at having kids. <laughs> so, um, she provides... Jacob with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, or it's Levi, I believe, and Judah. And the names of those, the meanings of those names are there. Reuben means see a son. Simeon means hearing. The, I think that was the Lord heard my prayer. I think that's what that was. Uh, Levi means joined. Judah means praise to Yahweh. Um, and it's Judah from whose tribe Christ arises. Judah is essentially promoted to the status of firstborn later in the story. This is important because Reuben, Simeon, and Levi all do something reprehensible. And so Judah gets, gets promoted to firstborn. And that's partly why in the logic of this narrative that it's from the tribe of Judah that Christ arises. So, so... Now, while this is going on, Rachel is like suicidally desperate for children. She's jealous of her older sister, who's rather ill-favored, as we pointed out, but who seems to be damn good at producing sons. And uh, she's really not happy with Jacob, and so she chews him out. And Jacob basically says, like, what do you want me to do about it? I'm not God, which is a reasonable response, I would say. And so, in her desperation, she gives Jacob Billa who's her maidservant. We've seen that sort of thing happen before. And two, Billa produces two children, Dan and Naf, Telly. Um, the reason I'm detailing out all these sons, it's important because Jacob is the founder of Israel, and his sons are the founder of the 12 tribes. So it's a pivotal moment in the story, right? It's because it's he's, the, he's the fundamental patriarch of of those who wrestle with God, because as we'll see, that's what the name Israel means. He gets the name Israel. You'll see why in a while. But, but it's, you, need, you need to know these genealogies in this situation because they play an important role in everything that happens afterwards. So, Naphtali is the second, uh, and her name, or his name means, with great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, right, contended with her, and have prevailed. So, that gives you some indication of the tension in the household. Now, Leah is now past bearing children. She gives Jake, Jacob her maidservant too, Zilpah, to keep up with her sister, I guess. And uh, now, Zilpah bears two children for Jacob. So he's piling up the kids left, right, and center here. Um, one of them is named Gad, good fortune, and the other is named Asher, happy or blessed. So there's more rivalry going on between the sisters. This is quite an interesting little story. So Reuben, who's Leah's daughter, um, goes out and looks for mandrakes. Now, mandrakes have aphrodisiac properties, so that's a little odd to begin with, but it doesn't matter. That's what happens. And uh, Rachel is... Rachel wants the mandrakes because she's still interested in having some children, and so she bargains with Leah to give her a night with Jacob in exchange for the mandrakes. And uh, more sons emerge as a consequence of that. So... And Rachel finally gives birth, Joseph. And Joseph plays a key role in the last story in Genesis, which I hope we'll get to in the next lecture, and then we can close off Genesis. That's the plan, anyways. So now, Jacob isn't really very happy about the whole arrangement because he, he's been there 14 years, and he, he's got two wives. It's not too bad, but, he, you know, he got... He, the bargain wasn't exactly clean. He doesn't really trust Laban, and, and there's no reason for him to do so. Um, 
Laban was poor before Jacob came. Jacob turns out to be a very useful uh, person to have around. And so he tells Laban he wants to leave and go back to his home country and uh, that he'll take the speckled and spotted cattle, the brown sheep, and the spotted and speckled goats from the flock. And they're in the minority, so that's the idea. And so Laban, or Laban, takes all those animals out of his flock. So there, there was an idea that the speckled goats and the brown sheep would breed true. So if you have two, a male goat and a female goat, and they're both speckled, they'll have speckled kids. That's the theory. And the same with brown sheep. And so what Laban does is he takes all the speckled animals out of the flocks, gives them to his son, and they go three days away with them so that Jacob is left with the flock, but with no with none of these animals. Now, the idea was that all the newborns were going to be his. And so what Laban has basically done is set it up so that in principle, um, Jacob is going to get nothing for his work. So that's another time when Jacob experiences betrayal. You know, it's almost as if God isn't done with reminding him of the magnitude of what he did in the past. That's the moral of the story in some sense. Now, there's a weird little twist in the story here. So what Jacob does is some sympathetic magic. And so when the animals are rutting, he puts speckled objects in front of them, speckled branches and so forth, I guess to remind them about what they're supposed to be producing, something like that. And it works. And so all these animals that Laban left are, are uh, producing spotted animals like mad. And so that's I guess God's changed his mind and let Jacob off the hook slightly here. So, soon he was very wealthy. Much cattle, maid servants, men servants, camels and asses. Laban's sons become jealous and Laban is outraged. Well, you know, obviously there's some competition there between Jacob and the sons, which is hardly surprising. And Laban played this trick to strip Jacob of all his property, and instead he got far more than he was going to get to begin with. So you can imagine that's been a bit annoying. So Jacob thinks he better get out of there. So he tells Rachel and Leah, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it's not toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know, with all my power, I've served your father. And your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times, but God so far has suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bore speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straked shall be thy hire, then all the cattle bore ring straked. Thus God has taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And they decide to sneak away. And they're unhappy with the inheritance, lack of inheritance from Laban. So as they sneak away, Rachel steals the idols that her father has in his house. And it's not exactly obvious why. There's a lot of contention about why she's doing that. Some of them is to punish him, to bring with her the images of her ancestors. You know, maybe she's lonesome moving away from home, just out of spite, to show him that the idols were actually powerless for protection, to stop her father from divining the root of their escape. That last one is the strangest one because the idea would be that Laban would have used some sort of Uh, ritual with the idols that would help him infer their escape route and then could chase them. So anyways, that's the range of speculation about that. I think it sounds to me mostly like a little act of revenge, maybe with a bit of um, loneliness mixed in. Laban pursues them, but God comes in a dream to tell him to leave Jacob unharmed. Laban catches up with him and reproaches Jacob, saying that he would have thrown a great party if he would have known that they were going to leave. You know, he didn't want them to sneak away in the night. And you you can't tell from the story whether that's true or not. And, you know, these people were pretty rough and impulsive, I would say. And maybe there was a 50% chance of a slaughter and a 50% chance of a party. Who knows? I've been to parties like that, actually. So... (laughs) Laban complains that his gods are gone, and Jacob says that whoever has them, he will have them killed. And Rachel, who's really quite a sneaky character, all things considered, basically claims that she's having her period, and she's sitting on the a, a carpet with all the idols underneath, and she can't move, and so they search everywhere and can't find them, and she's like laughing away behind her hand about that sneaky little maneuver. But she she doesn't die, so that's probably a good thing. So, Laban 
ch checks everything out, checks the camp out, and he can't find anything. So they reconcile. And so that's the first reconciliation that Jacob engages in. It's sort of like the... What would you say? The karmic debt has been paid. That's one way of thinking about it. That's, so he got punished for his wrongdoing. He's learned his lesson, perhaps. And it's, it's, that's good enough as far as he's concerned. You know, he got away good enough and they make peace. So then the next thing that happens as they're traveling is that Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man Man, angel, God, it's not clear. Uh, we'll go with angel, with him until the breaking of the day, or God. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the angel said unto him, what is thy name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And the angel said, thy name shall no more be called Jacob. So the supplanter, right? The, the overthrower with that kind of intonation of or implication of crookedness. But Israel, which means he who wrestles or strives successfully with God. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. That's quite a story. Like it's, it's, I, don't, I don't know exactly what to make of it. There's obviously a symbolic level of meaning, which is that that is what human beings do in some sense, is they, they wrestle, I would say, they wrestle with the divine, even with the concept of the divine, for that matter. And, but the question is, do they prevail? Like, it's kind of an odd thing that Jacob actually seems to win this battle, right? Or at least he wins it enough so that whoever he's wrestling, this divine figure that he's wrestling, is willing to bestow a blessing on him. I guess maybe that's a testament to his courage. It's something like that. Maybe it's an indication that he has paid for his sins sufficiently so that he's sort of back on the moral high ground. But, but I think it's really telling that the transformation of the name from Jacob to Israel and that what Israel means is he who wrestles with God or who struggles with God, and perhaps successfully. But it's also so interesting that he actually emerges victorious. You know, you wouldn't necessarily think that that would be a possibility, especially given, you know, God's rather hot-headed nature in the Old Testament. You don't want to mess with him too much. But, but Jacob does it successfully. But even more importantly is the idea that whatever Israel constitutes, which would be, to say, the land that Jacob founds is actually composed of those who wrestle with God. I think that's an amazing idea because it also seems to me to shed some light on perhaps what was meant by belief in those days, you know. Like I've often thought of, re of marriage as a wrestling match, right? If you're lucky, the person that you marry is someone you contend with. It's not exactly, I don't think it's exactly, it's not tranquil precisely. You know, you might have noticed that, some of you. And, <laughs> but, but the thing is, if you have something to contend against, then that strengthens you. And, and that's actually better than having nothing to contend against. And so, Jacob is the person who's also strengthened by the necessity of this contending. And that seems to be the proper relationship with God or the angel, is that contending, the battling, right? Rather than some sort of kind of loose, weak statement of belief. I mean, I'm not trying to denigrate that to any great degree. It just doesn't seem like the right mode of conceptualization, right? Because human beings aren't, aren't like that. We're, we're contentious creatures. And that actually seems to be something that meets with God's favor in this situation. So, especially given that that's actually what he names the, well, the whole kingdom of the chosen people is the idea is that that's composed of those who contend with God. So that's, that's a hell of an idea, that, that's for sure. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, 
Wherefore is it thou dost ask after my name? So there's no, that's not happening. And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the place of the name of the place Peniel, for I, or Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And he passed over Peniel. The sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. Now, Jacob does walk away injured from this, right? So he has a permanent limp after that. And so that's also an indication of just how dangerous that contention actually is. Like he gets blessed, he wins, but he doesn't get away scot-free. And so, now, so Jacob goes back to Esau and he's terrified, even though it's been 14 years, he thinks maybe his hot-headed brother hasn't calmed down yet. And he has good reason to think that, I would say. So he sends messengers to Esau, who then sets out with 400 men. And so Jacob is not very happy with this whole idea. And he breaks his people into two bands so that maybe half of them cannot be killed. And then he takes from his large flocks a bunch of animals and a bunch of servants, and he sends them out to meet Esau, basically to say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a jerk, and uh, sorry about the whole birthright thing. And, uh, <laughs> and here's some animals, and, you know, maybe... Maybe that's the beginnings of, of an apology. It's something like that. And so, but he's not very convinced that that's actually going to work. But Esau, who actually turns out to perhaps have matured in the interim, perhaps that's one way of thinking about it, um, meets Jacob and says that just seeing him is enough. But Jacob insists that he takes the gift and Esau accepts. And, which is probably a wise thing because even if Esau is 95% convinced that just seeing his brother is enough, there's probably 5% of him that's still really not all that happy. And so you have to be careful, you know, when you say that you forgive someone because there might be a part of you that really doesn't, that really needs something else before you can actually say, okay, look, fine. You know, and you don't want to fool yourself about that because that 5% that hasn't been completely convinced, will find its voice at some point and then maybe undermine the whole reconciliation process. So you don't want to think that you're any better than you are, or any nicer than you are. It's not helpful. And so Esau is smart, I think. So while well, Jacob's smart to say, no, no, like, thanks a lot, but take the damn goats. And <laughs> Jacob and uh, Esau is smart enough to accept that. And he might do that maybe to, you know, to please Jacob, but also, I think, so that there really is the possibility of establishing peace. Because, hypothetically, the gift that's being offered is of sufficient magnitude to erase the debt of the loss of the birthright. It's something like that, right? It's, 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 it's the payment of the real debt. 